Hi, I'm Kate Gain, the Collections and Stories Project Manager with Museums and Galleries of New South Wales. I'm coming to you from Bundjalung country in the state's far north. And I'm Gary Crockett, also with Museums and Galleries New South Wales, here on Gadigal country in Sydney's inner west. In this presentation, Gary, Emily and I will unpack Crystal Clear, a unique publication we launched in 2019 and resulting from the first phase of the Collections and Stories project. As you'll see, Crystal Clear contains key information to help you get your digitisation work underway, from equipment must-haves like scanners, camera gear and lighting, to practical help on handling objects and setting up your photo shoot, right through to making sure that your digital files are safe and future-proof. But what makes Crystal Clear valuable is the way it's been tailored to fit regional situations, to help small collecting organisations create the same high quality digital records as our city based counterparts. It's worth saying that Crystal Clear provides practical instructions and guidance for both newcomers and more experienced hands. But we also recognise that photographing and scanning objects and creating digital files has its challenges. And, no doubt, some things mentioned only briefly here will deserve a little more explanation. So aside from reading Crystal Clear, do your own research on things like the specific cameras and scanners that you're using, or your lighting gear, and test out your studio setup before you begin in earnest. Given that every organisation will have slightly different photographic needs and environmental challenges, and of course different kinds of objects, you'll need to experiment. But with this, you'll discover your own tweaks and adjustments that will streamline your work and make digitisation more productive and enjoyable. Before we get started, make sure that you've got a hard copy of Crystal Clear on hand or download it from the Museums and Galleries New South Wales website. You might want to pause the presentation until you've done that. Once you're ready with a copy of Crystal Clear to take notes, we'll get going. In the next few sections, we'll look at the publication's contents, unpack the digitisation toolkit, discuss some aspects of object handling and conservation cleaning, and run through a basic example of a digitisation workflow. To start things off though, here's Emily, the Sector Development Manager here at Museums and Galleries New South Wales to talk us through what you'll find in the different sections of Crystal Clear. Thanks Kate, I'm here on Gadigal land in Sydney's inner west and as you've heard, my role is to give you a quick thumbnail tour of the publication's contents, so here goes. Starting on page 2, about this guide, which explains the background to Crystal Clear, including its regional focus and the range of tasks involved with digitisation. As well, it seeks to cut through the vast and varied advice out there on digitisation and its standards. Page three is preparing to digitize. This walks you through the so-called digitization toolkit, listing all the equipment needed to get things underway. This is a nuts and bolts chapter with a suggested list of camera gear and studio equipment, handy accessories and object supports, computers, software, and more. Next is page seven which is the standard specifications for photographic and scanning methods. This sets out sector-based benchmarks for doing digitization, advice on your camera settings, and a useful table summarizing how to configure your scanner settings to produce good results. On page eight, you'll find digitizing audio-visual objects. This looks at transferring from analog or outdated mediums, such as vinyl and shellac discs, film, audio and video reels, cassettes, CDs and DVDs, all of which face problems with playability, handling, quality, storage and obsolescence. Pages 10 through 20 cover digitising regional museum and gallery collections. This narrows in on the digitisation of various types of objects. The information in this table is broken into object types to provide a detailed guide on how to digitise these to get the best results, but minimise risk or potential damage to the objects. We encourage you to study this table very closely. It will help both plan and undertake your digitisation. Page 20 is 3D imaging. This covers the process of photogrammetry used for recording whole room panoramic interiors and 3D imaging capturing textured surfaces or in the modeling of three dimensional replicas of historic objects. You most likely won't do this on your own or without expert help, but it's good to know what it is, what's involved and some basics if you're thinking about going down this path in the future. 
Page 22, saving and using digital files, looks at the kind of image files you'll be saving from your camera and scanner and the creation of so-called preservation master files, which if done right, will mean you'll never have to re-photograph or scan that object or record again. Page 24, sources and useful links, sets out some of the key resources we turn to in developing Crystal Clear. And finally, page 25 is the appendix. This shows a few examples of photo shoot setups and workflows to illustrate how others have tackled digitization regionally. At the beginning of Crystal Clear, you'll find what we've called the digitization toolkit. This sets out the many bits and pieces you'll want to have on hand to get things underway. We've compiled this list from on-ground experience, so it's been tried and tested. The aim is to shortcut your planning for digitization and help you get the best results possible. First up is a camera, along with accessories, lenses, polarizing filters, memory cards and a card reader, a sturdy tripod and a remote shutter release to make sure that you take clear, in-focus shots. A color chart or checker and a scale bar are also critical. Make sure to study the guide carefully where you'll find detailed advice about each of these and a few other tools. Many projects will involve scanners and a light box for capturing documents, glass plate slides and smaller 3D objects. For your computer work, you'll need a system able to process large files along with external hard drives and cables and your preferred software for image editing like Photoshop, Lightroom or something similar. As for your studio setup, Here's a few things for starters. Good lighting is critical. Make sure you've got enough illumination to capture colour and details, as well as avoid shadowing around your objects. For your backdrop, use a matte finish paper roll on an adjustable stand or hung from a wall hook. Go with off-white or grey for most objects and black for shiny or glossy objects like this gold nugget from the Central West. Unlike cloth, it's not textured and won't compete with the object. This is especially evident when zooming the image online. And when the surface becomes grubby or marked, you can just pull out a new section and keep going. A few sheets of white cardboard to bounce light around is useful and may save you having to adjust your lighting. Also highly recommended is a light tent, which will save you enormous effort and time when shooting small and shiny or reflective items. Use a sturdy work table to elevate small objects. To photograph artworks or larger flat objects, use a painter's easel. To capture historic outfits or costumes, use a mannequin, along with plenty of acid-free tissue for padding out to give the clothes the shape they need. Keep a good supply of other accessories, such as beanbag pillows, snake weights, pencils, erasers, bulldog clips, conservation brushes, power cords and gaffer tape, and don't forget your nitrile gloves for handling objects. Believe it or not, a ladder will come in handy. You may need to tape over high windows to cut down glare when photographing something in situ, or get a good overhead view, or simply to shoot a large object, like this silk banner at Broken Hill. As always, planning is the key to having the right things on hand. And of course, if you find yourself up a ladder, think about your own safety and the safety of objects and people around you. On page 9 you'll find a handy checklist with all the items we've just mentioned, along with a number of checkboxes for so-called workflows to plan the movement of your objects and conservation cleaning. Here's Emily again with a set of general tips on managing objects in and around the photo shoot taken from page 6. Keep your pathways clear of trip hazards and obstacles. Trolleys are really helpful, especially when moving larger, heavy, or some fragile objects. Work with a helper. Another set of hands is often critical, not only for arranging things, but also for making photographic decisions, like arranging objects or adjusting lights, or different views of objects. Handle objects like eggs, period. Transport objects in containers or its own storage box if it has one. Try not to lift objects by their handles, which can commonly grow weak over time. Support fragile 2D items on a board. Wash your hands before handling objects or use nitrile gloves if preferred. Side note, avoid cotton gloves as they accumulate dirt and grease and can, in turn, harm objects. Don't sneeze or bleed on objects. Keep objects away from studio lights until it's time to shoot, then remove. Afterwards, repackage and return objects to storage as soon as possible.
Regarding planning, in the table we referred to earlier and in the appendix to Crystal Clear, we considered digitising objects relating to First Nations communities or families. We stress the need to work with First Nations peoples before and when you digitise, including to obtain informed and written consent. We understand that many regional organisations already work closely with First Nations communities or employ First Nations staff. For those who don't, digitisation can begin to build relationships. This will take time and it must take the time it needs to ensure First Nations communities and families make informed decisions about digitising and sharing object stories culturally important to them. Getting your objects ready for the shoot will require some level of conservation cleaning. And again, this tutorial provides an overview of object cleaning. It doesn't provide lessons about cleaning different types of objects. We do, though, point you in the direction of resources that will help you plan to clean your objects. While the conservation or collection management of some objects may seem straightforward or common sense, research the best practice cleaning recommendations or talk with your collection manager, other specialists or museum advisor before dealing with objects that you are unsure about. Not only will a clean object deliver a much better photograph and allow its details to stand out, this is the object's one time to shine. Given the chance to digitise isn't going to come around again soon, getting your collection camera ready makes good sense. But start by considering if any dirt is worth keeping. Think about whether soiled surfaces or patina are part of the object story that help to show its past and importance today. Use a vacuum with a gentle brush. To keep dust from recirculating, use one with a HEPA filter. Only clean where needed and aim for minimal impact. Go with a low suction setting, fitting a hose to the end of the nozzle or open the vent. Another side tip, partner the vacuum with a soft brush, coaxing dust into the suction area. Keep the nozzle off the surface as it can scratch. For smooth objects like ceramics, metal or glass, use a microfiber cloth. Ideally this should be a light clean, so avoid liquid or chemical products. If you're in any doubt, talk to a professional before starting and well before digitization gets underway. And on that last note, do all your cleaning or padding out and the arranging or mounting of objects before your photography sessions. All this work needs a clear space, good light, the proper tools and patience. And don't clean on the run, you may end up harming your objects. Here's an example of a simple digitisation workflow. We refer to it here to help explain the type of process you should map out to make your digitisation work effective and efficient. And any workflow will most likely include many workflows within it. The key is to break down your digitisation project into manageable actions or steps. This will not only help to ensure your work progresses smoothly, but it will help identify any likely problem areas which can be addressed before you begin your work. Over to you, Emily. So let's go step by step through this typical workflow. Start by selecting your objects. Once you have your list, think about what kind of setup you'll be using and group objects accordingly. For example, group similar sized objects and plan to photograph these in sequence. Doing this will lessen the need to adjust your lighting and camera settings. Starting with a list of objects will enable you to consider object cleaning and presentation needs before you pick up your camera. Coordinate the movement of objects from storage or display into the studio area using a transit area that is safe, sturdy and secure. Prepare the objects for photographing or scanning. In the case of photographing objects, once in place and well lit, take your main archive shot with a colour chart. Then capture additional views and details along with important features and damaged areas. Remember that the aim is to give viewers an uncomplicated or straightforward look at the object. Front on, from the back, the sides and top views, and hard to see details or inner workings. Don't spend time on arty shots, though sometimes unusual angles are helpful. In some cases, like with large objects and small spaces, it's inevitable. Once you have completed taking your series of shots, return the object to storage or display and start all over again with your next item.
Finally, it's worth emphasizing something we found of tremendous value. Work with a partner or partners. It'll improve your digitization results and make the process a more satisfying one. Not only will a partner help with planning and handling and digitizing objects, they'll bring another set of eyes to the project to help solve problems like capturing large or hard to photograph objects or setting up the best object layouts. Also, don't rush, take plenty of refreshment breaks and expect things to take longer than you thought. Digitization is far more enjoyable when you have someone to share the load with. Hopefully this has been a useful presentation on Crystal Clear and its application to your digitization work. Make sure to keep the publication handy, download it if you haven't already, and study it as a team. Follow the technical directions, check off your equipment and start sketching out the various workflows you'll need to have in place. But remember, it's also a living document, meaning it will include changes over time. The digital environment is constantly changing, awash with new equipment, software and information. Crystal Clear will seek to capture and include these changes when they occur, but don't let this hold you up and try not to feel overwhelmed. Just start creating a digital record and you'll soon settle into the swing of it. As we said at the beginning of this presentation, the aim of Crystal Clear is to get you started and guide you along the way. If you hit problems or have any questions, just let us know and we'll do our best to help. Thanks again for viewing this presentation and all the best with your very important digitization project.